The darkest day in history has passed. Jesus Christ has been the crucified, and his lifeless body is in the grave. But now it's Sunday, and the brightest day in history is beginning to dawn. It was the day that would bring eternal light and life to all who trusted and believed in Christ. It's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin, conquering Satan, and conquering death. The greatest event in human history, and I do believe that it was a historic event, was the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now it begins in verse 1, if you follow with me in your Bibles. It says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, some of you were at sunrise this morning and you got up very early in the morning. I have to admit that when I was driving at 5.30 to church, I'm thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> Even the preacher wants to go home and go to bed. <laughs> but I guess if Jesus could rise from the dead, I can rise from my bed and worship him. Amen. <laughs> so very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher and it was at the rising of the sun. This is Sunday morning. And they said among themselves, the women said, who will roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Now, as they were approaching, they were coming to finish the burial process on Jesus' body. Jesus has been crucified on Friday. I'm a traditionalist. I believe Jesus was crucified on Friday. Friday sundown began the Sabbath, so they couldn't prepare the body that they wanted in the way they wanted to, so they were hurried in the preparation, the ointment and the cloths. So they had to hurriedly bury Jesus. So on Easter Sunday morning, which was a Sunday, uh, they went very early to finish the preparation of the body. So that's why these women, they weren't going to see the resurrection. Now you would think they would have built grandstands, they'd be selling popcorn, they'd have tickets. Greatest event in history is just about to happen. But they were all weeping, they were all unbelieving, they were despairing. They didn't believe that Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. They didn't believe that he would be crucified. They thought he was the Messiah, he would set up his kingdom, and they were anticipating that. So all their hopes are shattered. So we have Jesus crucified on Friday. We have what's sometimes called Black Sabbath on Saturday, as his body lie lifeless in the grave. But then on Sunday morning, when they went early in the morning, their concern was the stone that was in front of the sepulcher. Who shall roll away the stone? So the women just went trusting that God would take care of that. But there was the stone, there was the seal, and there was the soldiers. And God took care of all their fears. You know, Easter is about not fearing. In a minute, they, the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. And Easter actually speaks of the fact that our fears can be de dealt with because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't need to be afraid. So the Lord went ahead of them and took care of these issues. Now, when they came that first morning that says that they actually came to the tomb, that they found three surprises. And this is what I want to focus on in verses four to six. It says, when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting at the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. That's King James for freaking out or afraid. And he said to them, Be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Behold the place where they laid him. Now, the three surprises, I want you to see it in the text, are first of all, the stone was rolled Away. Now, I mentioned it this morning in my message out on the grass that the stone wasn't just rolled away. The stone was lifted up and thrown to the side. And when you take the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and by the way, all four Gospels record the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whenever that happens in the Gospel stories, you know that it's an important event. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all record the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the stone was actually lifted up and thrown to the side. Now, they estimate that the stone had to at least be two tons in weight. So I don't know what the women were thinking, how they were going to get the stone rolled away, but God took care of the stone, but it was actually lifted up and thrown over to the side. I believe it's the Gospel of John 
that mentions that. And the Greek word that's used for that is that it was lifted up and thrown over to the side. So the stone was rolled away. Now, why was the stone rolled away? Let me tell you why it wasn't. Not so Jesus could get out. Jesus wasn't jumping around and there, let me out, let me out, let me out, let me out. In his new glorified body, he could pass right through the stone wall of that sepulcher. The stone was rolled away so that Mary and Martha and Salome and the women and the apostles could go in and see that the body of Jesus was gone, the grave was empty. So not so Jesus could get out, but so that they could get in. Then the second surprise is in verse 5. It says there were angels, or an angel in our text, in the grave. Notice verse 5. Entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man. Now that reference there to a young man is actually a reference to an angel. So he looked like a young man, but he was in radiant clothing, long white garments, and they were afraid. So an angel. Now, I say angels because, again, comparing other passages in the Bible, there were at least two angels. Now, some of the critics of the story of the resurrection say, well, which is it? Was it one? Was it two? Was it three? Was it four? I think it was thousands. And the accounts are not contradictory, they're complementary. So if, if Mark just mentions one, doesn't mean there couldn't have been two or three or four or five. So they don't contradict. There's a complementary there. And I believe that that whole area was just buzzing with angels. So the Bible says there was an angel at the head where the body of Jesus lie and one at the foot. Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, he just literally passed through his grave clothes. So had these strips of grave clothes around his body and 100 pounds of ointment, spike nard that they prepared the body. And Jesus literally just came out of that grave clothes. So his grave clothes were still lying there in the shape of his body, kind of like a cocoon. So Jesus just passed through that, and he was in a new glorified body. So when they went in, they saw an angel, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus lay. Some Bible students like to point out that in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, in the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels actually facing each other with their wings touching. And on the top of that mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, was the mercy seat where we, we, we know the presence of God dwelt. So it's almost like the grave of Jesus was forming a new mercy seat where God's presence dwelt and where we can meet with God. So they saw these two angels. And if you ever do an interesting study, you'll be amazed all through the life of Jesus, there were angels, 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 angels. Angels at his birth, angels at his temptation, angels at his baptism, angels all through in the Garden of Gethsemane, at the cross, at his resurrection. All through the life of Jesus, angels surrounded his life and ministry. But here's the third surprise, and this is our focus. In verse 6, the angels had a message for the women. The first Easter sermon ever preached. And I I find it so difficult to pass up using this angel's Easter message because it's such a great text and it's such a great outline in the sermon. In verse 6, notice it. The angel said to them, be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Look or behold the place where they laid him. Now, the message contains three parts. It contains a command, it contains an assurance, or three assurances, and then an invitation. So the angels had a command, an assurance, and an invitation. First of all, the command, notice in verse 6, he said to them, be not afraid. Now in the Greek, it's literally stop being afraid. So they were afraid, they were fearful, and the angel tells them, stop being afraid. Jesus' resurrection means the end of our fears. It means we don't need to fear life. We don't need to fear death. And we don't need to fear eternity. Everyone has fears and phobias. Maybe you're here this morning and you're fearful. You're worried about life. How are you going to pay the mortgage? Or how are you going to pay the rent? Or how are you going to find a place to rent? Or how are you going to you know, deal with your job? Or your marriage is struggling? Or your children are having problems? Or maybe you've just been diagnosed with some incurable disease or cancer, and you're worried about life, you're worried about issues in life. Maybe you're afraid to die. 
One of the greatest fears that men live with is the fear of death. No fear in death. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, when John was on the island of Patmos, he saw the risen, glorified, exalted Christ in heaven. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys, I love that, of hell and of death. I have authority over hell and of authority over death. So I don't need to fear life. I don't need to fear death. And then thirdly, I don't need to fear eternity. That's the Christian life. Amen? Amen. I don't need to worry about life. I don't need to worry about death. And I don't need to worry about where I go once I die. Someone once said, and I've always loved it, you're not, a, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. I like that. You're not really ready to live until you're ready to die. Once you're ready to die, and you're not worried about where you're going to go once you die, then you can really enjoy your life. So what a blessing. We don't need to fear in eternity. I love the famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when he comes to the end of the psalm, he makes that amazing statement, I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? Forever. Don't you love that? And when the Lord is your shepherd... Then and only then can you say, I will. I love the certainty of David's statement. I will, not I might, not I hope I will, not maybe. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if you're living with fear today, Jesus Christ can conquer your fears. But notice now the assurance or assurance says there are three of them that the angels gave the women that first Easter morning. First, they said Jesus was Crucified. Now, the first was a command, don't be afraid. Now they give him an assurance. That is number one, Jesus was crucified. Look at verse 6. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. Jesus was crucified on the cross. You can't have a resurrection without having a crucifixion. Actually, it starts with the incarnation. God became a man. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was the God-man. Then it goes to the crucifixion where Jesus died on the cross voluntarily, vicariously, a substitutionary death. He took our place. He died in our stead. He was the sinless Son of God, but He gave His life for us. And then it thirdly goes to the resurrection as Jesus rose physically, bodily from the grave. And then it moves to the ascension. Jesus visibly, bodily, physically rose back into heaven. They watched him go to heaven. And then it goes then lastly to the exaltation. He is seated at the right hand, the place of authority in heaven. And guess what? It's not over yet, right? He's coming back. Amen? He's coming back. So the same Jesus who was crucified, buried, risen, ascended, exalted in heaven, is coming back and He will set up His kingdom forever and ever. There will never be an end to the divinic kingdom. Now, Jesus was crucified. So He was crucified, 1 Corinthians 15.3, for our sin. That's why Jesus died. He died for our sin. He died as a substitution for our sin. In Isaiah 53, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By His stripes we are healed. So our sins were placed on Christ so that His righteousness can be given to us. The theological term for that is imputation. So He took our sin and then His righteousness is imputed to us and we are righteous in Jesus Christ. Now, notice the second assurance in verse 6. He is what? Risen. I love that. He is risen. He was crucified. He is risen. The Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And as I said earlier, all four Gospels record the resurrection story and account of Jesus Christ. Now, what kind of resurrection was it? It's not a spiritual resurrection. It was not a metaphysical resurrection. Some people go, I, 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 be I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I believe that everyone is resurrected, that it's a spiritual or metaphysical resurrection. No, it was a literal bodily resurrection. His body actually came out of the grave. It's not enough to say that Jesus just rose spiritually. Actually, 
Biblically speaking, the only true resurrection is a physical resurrection. Spirits don't resurrect. They never die. Spirits don't need to stand up. Bodies stand up. So the body was laying down in the grave. As resurrection is the resurrection of the body. And Jesus rose from the dead physically and bodily. So when he says Jesus is risen, he's talking about a physical, literal, bodily resurrection. And let me point out, as like it is with so much in the life of Christ, Jesus is the only human being to ever physically die and come back from death in a in a immortal, eternal, glorified body, never to die again. Now some people get confused because there's other people in the Bible that died and God raised them from the dead. But they came back from the grave or back from death in their mortal bodies and had to die again, which is kind of like a bummer, right? If I die, don't pray to resurrect me, okay? God will do that in his good time. But they had to come up. When Lazarus came out of the grave, he had to die again. So we know that Jesus came out in a glorified, immortal body, eternal, never to die again. What a glorious truth that is. So the same body in which he was crucified was resurrected, and now it's glorified and immortal, never to die again. Jesus predicted his death during his public ministry in John chapter 2, after he'd cleansed the temple and the Jewish leaders said, what authority do you have to do this? Jesus said, destroy this temple. And he said these words, in three days, I will raise it up. And then John pointed out, this spake he of his body. So Jesus would actually raise himself from the grave. You know, the Bible actually teaches God the Father raised God the Son from the dead and that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead, and the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. All three of them were involved in the Godhead in raising Christ from the dead. Now notice the third assurance in verse 6. He is not here. So the command, don't be afraid. The assurance, Jesus was crucified. Jesus is risen. And then notice thirdly, he is not here. Now, I don't know what it is, but every time I read those little words, he is not here, I just want to start shouting for joy. All of our hopes for eternity and the forgiveness of our sins are in that empty tomb. What a glorious truth that is. So Jesus Christ rose from the dead and the evidences are clear. Now, let me give a a couple evidences for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I'll keep it short and simple. First of all, in our text, we see the tomb was empty. Now, when we say empty, we say almost empty because the grave cloths were still there. But Jesus Christ has gone. And you know, all the critics that try to deny the resurrection cannot deny the fact that the tomb was empty. Now, they can try to explain the empty tomb, but none of their explanations hold water. But they can't deny the fact that the body was missing. Now, Many of the different theories on the empty tomb is one called the swoon theory. And the swoon theory is that when Jesus was hung on the cross, he didn't physically die. He just swooned. He just passed out. And so they thought he was dead, but he wasn't really dead. And so they put the ointment on him. They put him in the tomb. They sealed it. And he lay there for three days. And somehow, rather than finishing him off, it revived him, helped him to revive. And somehow... In his uh, weakened state, he was able to roll the stone away, overtake the Roman soldiers, find the disciples and appear to them in a locked room and convince them that he's risen from the dead. I don't think so. So the swoon theory does not hold water. And then the other theory is the thief stole the body theory. That's the one that is recorded for us in the, in the Bible. Tell them that thieves came and stole the body. But who stole the body? The disciples certainly wouldn't steal the body. They didn't believe he was going to rise from the dead. Why would they steal the body, preach that he rose from the dead, and suffer martyrdom for what they they knew to be a lie? No one's going to die for what they know is a lie. They might believe it's true and be deceived, but if they stole the body, they would know that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Why would they all face martyrdom? Why would the Jewish authorities steal the body when they tried to stop the preaching of the resurrection 
All they would have to do is put the body in a cart and pray it down Main Street, Jerusalem, and it would have killed Christianity. The Roman authorities, they didn't have any motive for stealing the body. So the thief stole the body theory does not hold water. And then the one that's really hilarious is the wrong tomb theory. The women were just so emotional and so filled with tears and so upset and they weren't very good with directions. <laughs> Sorry. I can't believe I said that, but I did. And they just thought that they had the right tomb, but they had the wrong tomb. Well, if the women had the wrong tomb, then so did the angels which were hanging out inside the tomb. And so did Peter and John when they ran to the tomb. You know, if you bury a loved one on Friday and you go back on Sunday, you don't forget where you put them. You don't go, where did we put Uncle here? I don't know, just throw the flowers, he's out there somewhere. <laughs> They'll land somewhere. I'm sure that every one of you have a grave somewhere that you know somebody you love, and you know exactly where it is. You'll never forget it. So when they went back, they did not find a wrong tomb. That theory holds no water. But then notice also the second evidence for the resurrection, not just the empty tomb, but it's the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus himself. Now, there's more than we can cover in one message, but for a period of 40 days... The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, Luke the historian, Jesus appeared and showed himself alive to his disciples by many infallible proofs. Many infallible proofs for a 40-day period before he ascended. But notice in verse 9 and 10, we have a reference to Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene. Notice it says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, which was Sunday, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And she went and she told them that they had been with him as they had mourned and wept. And so they went and they had, went, and so they, excuse me, and they, when they had heard that, he was alive and had been seen of her. Notice this, believe not. Now notice in verse 10, they were mourning and weeping. And when the women said, we've seen him, they believed not. How Sad that is. So the first unbelievers were his own followers. But he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And then secondly, my favorite is verse 12 and 13. It's a reference to the Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, the two disciples. It says, after he appeared in another form to two of them, as they walked and went into the country, and they went and they told it to the residue, neither believed they them. So the women, Mary, told them, I've seen the Lord. And that took place in John 20. And then the two on the road to Emmaus, they ran back to Jerusalem, which was a seven-mile journey. And they said, we've seen the Lord. And they again did not believe them. Verse 13. Now, as I said, my favorite is the road to Emmaus recorded in Luke chapter 24, where these two disciples are walking back after that afternoon of the resurrection. And they heard the rumors and the reports that Jesus Christ has risen, but they didn't believe it. So their hearts were sad, they were heavy. And as they're walking along the road, going back to their home, guess who shows up and walks along with them? Jesus. Now, the Bible says that their eyes were held or blinded, so they didn't know it was Jesus. So he was kind of coming incognito. So they're walking along and Jesus strikes up a conversation. I wish I could have been there. He said, what, why are you sad? Why are you so discouraged? And they said, why are you a stranger in these parts? Haven't you heard about Jesus? A man proved of God, did mighty miracles and wonders, and we thought he was the Messiah. And he went and got crucified, and the women said they saw him, but we don't believe it. And so everything is gone. Our hopes are shattered. And they were listening they were, they were speaking to Jesus about Jesus. So Jesus actually said, no, no, what things? Tell me. And they're pouring out their hearts. They're pouring out their complaints. And then Jesus stopped and he started giving them a Bible study. He said, oh, you simple ones. The King James says fools. It's a little harsh translation there. Oh, you simple ones. To believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Ought not Christ, the Messiah, to have suffered and died and then entered into his glory? And so beginning in the law and the prophets and all the writings of Moses, he began to explain to them how the Messiah would come and suffer and die. And then when they finally arrived at the end of this Bible study at their house there in Emmaus, they compelled him, come in and eat with us. So Jesus went in. They still don't know it's Jesus. They knew he's a good Bible teacher. Amazing insights. I wish that was recorded in the Bible for us. But they said, would you, would you pray over the food? And Jesus took the bread. And when he lifted up the bread and began to pray to bless it, they saw the scars in his hands. And their eyes were opened. And they realized it was Jesus. But the moment they realized it was Jesus, he disappeared. And I'm sure they had that, oh, the stupid things we said in his presence. <laughs> you ever been in the presence of somebody really important and you said dumb stuff and you didn't know it? And afterward, you realize who you were talking to. Oh, I can't believe I said that. So Jesus appeared to them and opened on the scriptures. And then they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened unto us the scriptures? So the word of God burning in their hearts. And then thirdly, verse 14, he mentions that he was appearing to the 11. And my guess is that Thomas was present at this time. Afterward, verse 14, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at dinner, and he upbraided them for their unbelief, hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So look at verse 10. They mourned and wept. In verse 11, they believed not. In verse 13, they believed not. And then in verse 14, unbelief, hardness of heart, believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So the resurrection was so powerful in its post-resurrection appearances that Jesus finally convinced them that he was alive, that he's risen. He said, touch me, handle me. Spirit has not flesh and blood as you see me have. Be not unbelieving, but believing. And eventually they were changed. So the, that's the third evidence of the resurrection. The first is the empty tomb. The second one was the post-resurrection appearances. And the third one was the changed lives. They were taken from fear to faith, from hopelessness to hope. The disciples were changed. Saul of Tarsus, Acts 9, was changed. People today are being changed. So many of you are here celebrating Easter this morning because you have met the risen Savior. Amen? And you know your life has been changed. I was thinking about the transformation that happened in my life so many years ago today. How Christ came into my heart and He changed me from the inside out. What a glorious truth, the changing. 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become what? Brand new. Now, the last and the third point is the invitation. I love it. Verse 6. Behold the place where they laid him. Now, this is the spot in the statement of the angels where we usually miss it. You say, well, he's not here. He's risen. Look at where he was laying. Okay, I just glance at it. Just look at it. But the grammar in the Greek and the word they're used is actually very, very specific. It means to look with understanding. It means to think deeply. When he says, behold see the place where the Lord lay, he's actually inviting them to understand the implications, the ramifications, the results of the resurrection. So you can, you can do all you want to as a Bible student looking at the resurrection, and it's marvelous. But the real rubber meets the road is the so what, right? You might even say, okay, I, I, I'll buy that. Jesus rose from the dead. So what? Well, let me give you the list, and then we'll wrap this up. The list could be a lot longer I've narrowed it down to eight things that result from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First of all, as to his person, if you're taking notes, everything Jesus said is true, and Jesus is the Son of God. In Romans, it says the resurrection of Jesus Christ set him off as the Son of God. So if Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection, and he was crucified and he rose from the dead, why not believe everything Jesus said? Everything he said about himself, everything he said about heaven, everything he says about hell, 
everything he says about life, everything Jesus said is true. And when Jesus said in John 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Actually, it's John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Guess what? It's true. It may be narrow, but it's true. The nature of truth is that it's exclusive. Anything other than that is not true or it's a lie. So Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And then he added these words, no one gets to the Father except by me. So he's the only one that came from heaven, born of a virgin. He was the God-man, lived a sinless life. He's the only one that died on the cross for man's sin. He's the only one that rose from the dead. He's the only one that ascended back into heaven. He's the only one that can save. That's why there's only one way to get to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can save. So as to his person, everything Jesus said is true. When he told Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. Guess what? You must be born again. No one can enter into the kingdom of God except he is born again. So we can trust Jesus. He should be the object of our faith. Secondly, his pardon. Not only his person, but his pardon. It means my sin can be forgiven. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we could have no assurance or no hope or no confidence that we could be forgiven of sin. Write down 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17. If Christ be not risen from the dead, we are still in our sins. That's what Paul says. But now Christ is risen from the dead and our sins have been forgiven. In Psalm 103 verse 12, the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he what? removed our transgressions from us. You know that you can trust Jesus Christ today as your Savior, and He will forgive all of your sins, and you will have a clean heart and be right with God, and you can leave here today ready to live, no fear of life, death, or eternity, because you know Christ as your Savior. He can dispel your fears. He can pardon your sins. Have you been forgiven? Number three is His power. Philippians 3, verse 10, Paul said, For I know that I might know Him in the power of His resurrection and be conformed unto His death. This is talking about living the resurrected life. Living in the power of His resurrection. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead can dwell in you and give you the ability to live a life free of sin. Now, you're not going to be sinless, but you will sin less and less and less as you walk in the Spirit. The Bible says you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you're bound by some besetting sin, Jesus Christ can set you free. That's what the resurrection means. It means I can be free from the guilt of sin. I can be free from the power of sin. Here's number four. It means His presence. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know, if you're a Christian, you're never alone. Jesus promised to be with us. He said in His great commission, Lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. You're never alone. That's why we sing, He walks with me, He talks with me, He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share, no other has ever known. Just to know Him as my Savior and my friend. Everywhere I go, every place I go, He's with me. I cannot be separated from Him. And then fifthly, write it down, His purpose. Life without God is empty. You ever read the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Life under the sun, life without God, no purpose, no meaning. There's no real meaning, no significance, no fixed point on which to follow my life. You're empty without God. But the resurrection brings purpose and meaning, not only in this life, but in the one to come. And then sixthly, write it down, we have His promise. The promise that Jesus gave in John 14, He said, if I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's house, He goes, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be what? Also. So don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You, you, you believe in God, believe in Me. I'm going to go back to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place. But he promised. Now, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what good is his promise? 
Do you know a dead person can't save you? Somebody who's dead can't save you. They can't help you. Only a living Savior can save us. And only it promises is, is true. So what Jesus promised, I'm going to come back, I can bank on His promise. When Jesus said, I will prepare a place for you, and I'm going to be, you're going to be with me forever, I can bank on that promise because He lives. Heaven is a place. Heaven is a real place. Heaven is a prepared place. But then seventhly, and this is one of my favorite, His pattern. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that one day our bodies... And I'll explain what I mean even if you're not a Christian. Even if you're not a Christian, one day your body will be resurrected. Some to life and some to damnation. Every human being will be resurrected. There's two resurrections. The resurrection of life, the resurrection of condemnation and judgment. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.20. He said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Now the phrase them that sleep is referring to Christians who have died and it's only referring to their physical bodies. And sleep is a temporary state, meaning that one day they will be awakened or resurrected. So did you know that every one of our bodies, you say, I don't like my body, I don't want it resurrected. Don't get too freaked out. It'll be new and improved. You should be excited about that. <laughs> when you get home from church today, look in the mirror and go, I'm going to have a new and improved me. <laughs> you don't need plastic surgery. You just need a resurrection. <laughs> Can't believe I said that either. <laughs> I think it's because I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I don't know anybody that's getting older that doesn't look forward to a new body. The Bible says our bodies are tense. Mine's leaning and flapping in the wind right now. <laughs> the stakes are pulled up and it's flapping in the wind. It's ready to blow away. A building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And in this body we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our body which is from heaven. Do you realize what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means? It means that he's the prototype. When it uses the phrase first fruits, that's the first in gathering of the harvest. And there was more to follow. It's kind of like a down payment as well. So more to follow. So Jesus is the prototype, the first human being, the humanity of Christ, dead in the grave, come out in a new glorified body. Same Jesus, but new and improved, eternal body, never to die again. So one day we will be resurrected. That's why when Paul wrote to the believers in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said, I don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope. I don't want you to be ignorant about those that have died or fallen asleep. Did you sorrow like others who have no hope? For if we believe that Jesus, what, died and rose again, even so who, those who fall asleep in Jesus, God's going to bring back with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, we're not going to precede those that have died, but the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's their physical bodies. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, will be raptured to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. That's the reunion. So there's resurrection, there's rapture, and there's reunion. All of it is founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when you go home today and celebrate Easter, remember that the resurrection means that we will have a new resurrected body. But lastly, eighthly, it also means his punishment. When Paul was preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, Rome, in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, he mentioned these words. He said, He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. This is in simple language what Paul is saying. He's saying, when Jesus was risen from the dead, God the Father actually was saying that all people will be raised from the dead and they will actually stand in judgment before this man I raised from the dead. This is why when you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, and you see at the end of time when all the wicked dead are resurrected, 
there's a great white throne set in heaven. Guess who's sitting on the great white throne? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And all the books are opened. And whoever's name is not found written in the book of life, the people that are resurrected, only the wicked dead are resurrected, they will be cast into a lake of fire, which is actually the second death. This is what we know as eternal hell. So they come out of the graves, their bodies are reunited with their spirits, and then they are judged, found not written in the book of life because they didn't trust Jesus as Savior, and they are thrown into a lake of fire. Now you say, I didn't didn't come to church Easter Sunday to hear you preach about hell. I know you didn't, but you're hearing it. (laughs) Because without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's our destiny. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we all go to hell. Jesus died to save us. He died to rescue us. He died to reconcile us. All that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus actually will sit on a throne judging even the wicked dead. That's good news for the believer that Jesus did die and my sins can be forgiven because He rose from the dead. I can have salvation And I do not have to stand before the great white throne and be judged for my sins. And you say, well, what do I need to do to be forgiven? What do I need to do to go to heaven? What do I need to do about Jesus? What response should I have? Three things. Number one, realize that you, I, we are sinners. That there's no one righteous, no, not one. The Bible says all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. Now granted, some are bigger sinners than others, but we're all sinners. And all it takes is one sin. We're born sinners separated from God, and then we have committed sin and transgressed. Willful, deliberate disobedience. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and that we, the soul who sins, you'll surely die. So that's what Jesus did when He died, He died for you, your death. He paid a debt he didn't know. You owed a debt you couldn't pay. And so you need to realize, I'm a sinner. And then secondly, you need to repent. And the word repent simply means to change your mind, but it results in a change of direction. So it means a 180. I'm walking this way, I repent, I turn and go the other way. I realize I'm a sinner, I'm going to hell. I need to turn and I need to trust Jesus. And that's the third step. Third step is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Realize I have sinned. Wages of sin is death. Repent, turn from my sin, and then receive or trust in or believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say, that's all I have to do? Jesus did the work. He did it all. He paid it all. We owe everything to Christ. But you must open the door of your heart. He won't force Himself on you. You must have your own will and your own volition. Say, Christ, I believe in You. Jesus, I receive You. Jesus, I turn from my own way, my own stubborn will, my sinful patterns of living, my way of thinking. I turn and I receive You as my Savior. Going to church won't get you to heaven. Being baptized won't get you to heaven. Being religious won't get you to heaven. Going to church on Easter Sunday doesn't get you to heaven. Sorry to break that to you. It's only by trusting Jesus Christ, by reaching out in faith and putting your confidence in Him. And I want to give you an opportunity right now, right here this morning, before we leave. If you're here and you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptance time. Jesus said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock, and if you hear my voice and open that door, I will come in and I will have fellowship with you. He can forgive your sins. You can be saved by trusting Him. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer. I want you to repeat it out loud right where you are after me. 
Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.